Hi, I'm Jordan Thorne and we're here at GreenBuild 2019. Today I'm joined by Amanda Sturgeon. She's the CEO of International Living Future Institute. Amanda, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, happy to be here. Fantastic. So can you tell me a bit about how you came to be in your current role? Yeah, well, I um, traveled um, before I went to study architecture and I fell in love with the natural world and I either wanted to be a park ranger or wow. um, someone that could uh, bring kind of the spaces we spend every day in and the spaces we tend to retreat to at weekends or you know when we have our free time together. Um, so I was really drawn to architecture and an architecture that could, could blend that inside and outside space and connect people in nature mm -hmm. uh, very early on before I even went to study architecture. And then that's really been the driver for my career. Um, how can I create buildings that connect us to nature and uh, to the place and climate? Amazing. I mean, so you've worked with biophilic design through much of your career. Mm -hmm. How can bringing nature inside our office spaces and buildings impact humans as a collective? And sort of what correlation can you draw on this sort of further contributing to shaping a more sustainable society? Yeah, well, I think buildings, uh, you know, we spend 95, 98% of our time inside. Um, so buildings have an opportunity to really shape who people are, shape who our society is, uh, shape you know, our health, our happiness, um, our relationships with each other, with the place that we're in and, and the place that we're spending our time in. So I mean I think buildings are just critical to um, being able to connect us to nature. You know, we're becoming increasingly urbanized, so we're spending more and more time inside, more yeah. and more time in cities uh, as a global human race. And, um, you know, I, I'm concerned that that could cause us to really not love nature, to not love other living systems, mm. and just continue to see more and more species extinct as well as more habitat. Um, destroyed and you know ultimately I think that will be our demise because we rely on all of that to yeah. survive um, so we have to find a you know a harmony between the way that we live now and the you know extent of our population growth and the natural world and I do think that the built environment is critical to bring those two things together mm -hmm. um, to really bring natural solutions into the city um, and to connect people ultimately to really that love of other living species. Yeah, amazing. And so how do you consider the humanistic needs of a green building in the sort of whole life cycle? Yeah, I mean I think um, you know many of our buildings are around for a long time and um, you know, they play a role both from when a building's being brought into a community and being built and how it contributes to, you know, economic job growth and um, community development um, all the way through to, um, you know, its end of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, buildings should be ecosystems like, you know, uh, the natural world is. Um, they should live and breathe with a community. They should adapt over time. Mm -hmm. um, they should respond to changing social needs. Um, so I think you know the demands on buildings now are to be much more adaptable, yeah. um, to be able to think about you know potential climate change as well and how they might adapt to that and be resilient to that. So um, I think the key things you know for the next few decades are going to be buildings that can be resilient, adaptable, and um, you know really uh, respond to the natural conditions. Mm. I mean. You know, stakeholder engagement in green building practices is becoming the most important missing point in the green building chain. So how can leaders convince their biggest stakeholders to buy into it? Yeah, you know, often from a business perspective it has to be about economics. Um, yeah. And, you know, you have to make economic arguments so often, even though we know intuitively that it might be the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, we might know that just from you know it's in the impact of green building on climate change, or even from you know our own sense of like okay, I feel so much better, I'm happier when I'm in a green building. Um, but often we have to make that economic argument mm -hmm. to get business interests to go with it. So, you know, one of the um, 
uh, arguments that I'm able to make often is around this connection between people and nature and that's a way that we can get businesses to respond. If they have healthier, happier employees, mm -hmm. um, it's actually a huge cost impact. Employees tend to be the biggest single cost for a, a big business yeah. and if they have easier recruitment and lower, ret you know, high retention, lower turnover, um, because people are happy and healthy in the space they're working in, it ultimately saves them money. So um, I think you know, we have to make economic arguments like that often that um, you know, this is for the good of uh, employees, it's for the good of a business. Yeah, incredible. Do you have maybe one killer fact that could sort of get any business to buy into sustainability? Yeah, the one I like to use is that when people spend one hour in nature, they, um, it, there's a 20% increase in productivity. Wow. And that has been mapped as a University of Michigan study um, to show that, yeah, just that one hour in nature. And so that's a huge uh, amount of money mm -hmm. for a business. Um, I think that's why we're seeing some of the big companies, Amazon, Google, you know, Salesforce bring in biophilic design yeah. into their projects because if their workers are spending, you know, an hour kind of in, in some kind of restorative nature um, experience mm -hmm. that when they come back to their desks, they're going to be way more productive, um, which ultimately affects the company's bottom line. Yeah, sounds incredible. I would love to work in a space like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so given your views on biophilic and green design thinking, what do you envision the future of the workplace looking like 10 to 20 years down the line? Yeah, I see the interior of workspaces in particular being a lot more um, like a sort of natural ecosystem. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think we will go away with the standard cubicle open office situation mm -hmm. or even closed office situation. I think what we will see is a diversity, an ecosystem of different experiences. Nobody mm -hmm. has one desk they come to all the time. They could choose to sit in a, in a regular regular desk, they could choose to be in a standing desk, they could choose to, um, you know, be more in a couch situation and that, you know, workers will be able to really revolve around. Mm. I think with the increasing uh, remote work and ability for people to work really from anywhere as well, we'll see, um, you know, sort of a much more sort of networked offices that are dispersed, um, okay. that people can really work anywhere. I know we're experiencing that in our organization. We've, we've gone just from the last um, couple of years to you know, almost a third of our workers, um, our employees being remote. And oh, wow. I see that trend more and more. There's some activities where you have to be huddling in teams, yeah. but with technology and video conferencing and you know, um, chatting, and you know, there's um, you know, a lot of opportunities to stay connected yeah. and really engaged. Um, so yeah, I see it becoming more remote, more remote working, and I also see there being more adaptable workspaces where people can really kind of have different experiences through the day, sit in the sun for an hour, move, yeah. you know, be in more control of their environment. Given that your role has very much um, been about sort of the wellness and sort of how people feel and interact with nature, some of the um, interviews we've done throughout the week have sort of not contradicted what you've said, but so they've argued like, oh, people shouldn't work at home because, um, you know, we are, are a culture of people who want to sort of get together. So I guess what is the argument for saying actually, is there, is there um, and I'm sure many people will say, yeah, absolutely, yes, it's <laughs> amazing to be able to sort of be flexible and work from home, but sort of is there a benefit to, to both? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of our remote workers actually aren't working out of their homes. They're working in co-working spaces. Ah, okay. They're working with a partner that we might have that has a spare desk in a different city. Yeah. Um, because many of them, even though they're remote from our main office in Seattle, they uh, really are very social and, um, you know, they want to be around people and a yeah. group of people. So most of our remote um, staff are actually working in someone else's sort of space. Okay. And, but it's much more transitional. They might do a, you know, a day at home if they're really working on something they've got to concentrate on. They might go into the co-working space. Yeah. They might be traveling somewhere else. So I think, um, you know, it's, it's looking different all the time mm -hmm. for people. Um, 
you know, and I, you know, obviously when somebody has to spend their whole time sort of seated at a desk or at a computer, then, um, you know, I think it makes it a little bit more difficult to, to move around all the time. Yeah. But I still think there's an opportunity to really be in a diverse sort of experience of spaces. I think, um, yeah, I think diversity is the key thing, you know, no matter what that looks like. Yeah. Um, that I see young um, professionals now that are entering the workplace really demanding, um, you know, flexibility, mm. diversity of space and experience. Um, and they want to, you know, sort of challenge that. And they kind of expect that because they're yeah. used to growing up in school with, you know, they've grown up their entire lives with with phones where they can reach people and they're globally connected. Yeah. Um, so they have a really different way of thinking, I think, than mm. folks that are a little older yeah. do um, in terms of how they can stay connected with anyone anywhere. Yeah. Really interesting. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. You're it's welcome. been an absolute pleasure speaking with nice you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs>